Hello, my name is Haley Wegreich, and today I will be discussing the fatigue performance of nitinol and 35 NLT in a simulated biomedical environment. This research is in collaboration with Dr. Janet El Gabor and Dr. John J. Lewandowski at the Case Western Reserve University Department of Material Science and Engineering. Here's a little roadmap of the presentation with the science work that led up to my study. An interlaboratory study was published by ASTM International with the goal of assessing the repeatability and reliability of rotating bending fatigue tests. The IRLS study consisted of 10 labs assessing the fatigue performance of nitinol and 35 NLT in body temperature, continuously flowing baths of either reverse osmosis or deionized water. In addition to the ILS, another student conducted fatigue tests of both materials at the same strain levels in ambient air. These two studies resulted in a large data set that I used as a starting point for my research. The results are seen in this graph on the right where nitinol is in blue and 35 NLT is in purple. The preliminary data shows that as the strain amplitude increases, the cycle to failure decreases. I have some more information about the materials here. They were sourced from Fort Wayne Metals and their chemistry in the wire dimensions are included in these tables. The thing about the two materials that influence work the most is their applications, which include many biomedical devices. In order to better understand how I accomplished the goal of understanding the performance in biomedical environment, it is important to understand the test itself. This image shows the test apparatus. The two shafts labeled A are the rotating collets, which hold a wire in a horseshoe and rotate care. Fully reverse tension and compression at the apex of the bending radius. The string amplitude is controlled by the distance between the collets, and the whole apparatus can be submerged to conduct tests in fluid baths. The primary advantage to this test method is that it can achieve high cycles relatively quickly. As I mentioned, the goal of this study is to better understand the fatigue performance of the materials and biomedical applications, so my test parameters are a little bit different than the previous studies. I added additional lower strain amplitudes for each material and conducted my study in a dilute phosphate buffered saline solution to simulate in vivo conditions. This graph here shows the results of my study in comparison to the previous ones. My results are the diamond data points, and again, the nitinol is in blue and the 35 NLT is in purple. This graph clearly shows that the tests conducted in PBS listed lower cycles to failure than either the RO or DI water or the dry air. Following these tests, the fracture surfaces were examined in electron microscopy, or SEM. The image shows, this image here shows two specimens of 35 NLT at 0.6% strain. The specimen on the left was tested in RO water and the one on the right was in the PBS solution. These specimens both show fracture surfaces that I would expect to see from this type of test. For example, in this image on the left, on the right side of the line is the fatigue region, which is characterized by striations running through the region. This is where a crack has started with a non-metallic inclusion, which the crack then propagated as the test continued, causing the lines. When the sample eventually failed catastrophically, it created the overload region, which, which is distinguished by the dimpling pattern. The one on the right follows a very similar pattern. My analysis of several specimens of 35 NLT tested in RO water and PBS at several strain amplitudes showed the same pattern. The nitinol was a little bit more interesting. The image on the far left shows nitinol in RO water at 1% strain. The fracture surface shows the same features as the 35 NLT one on the previous slide. The only major difference is that the initiation point is clear in this image. The middle image was tested in PBS and shows larger deformation and overload when compared to its RO water counterpart. The image on the right was tested in PBS at lower strain amplitudes, and this is where it got really interesting. As strain amplitudes lower than 0.9%, I started to see large cavernous initiation points, as I've highlighted here with the callout. There were also elevated ridges through the fatigue region as indicated by the arrow. So, some of the conclusions that I was able to draw from the study were that, in general, as the strain amplitude increases, the cycles to failure decreases. The nitinol and 35 NLT saw decreased fatigue performance when compared to RO or DI water in a drier conditions. The SEM of nitinol tested in PBS revealed features like large craters at the initiation point and ridges through the fatigue region. The SEM of the 35 NLT showed similar surfaces across all strain amplitudes in RO water and PBS. So, these conclusions led me to some questions and some future work that I will be doing. The primary goal of my continuing research is to determine the cause of the craters in the nitinol fractures. To do this, I will follow the steps that are highlighted here. I also would like to continue the goal of 
understanding how the materials perform in actual biomedical applications. So to do that, I would like to test at even lower strain amplitudes. Thank you to these people for their continuing support. And my references can be found here. Thank you.